Hello and welcome to the Cabin Boy and It's Woolcast, coming to you deep from the Canadian forest. This is Christopher. And this is the other guy. Jamie. In this episode, we're going to be talking about sheep shearing. And we got mail. And I have a summer whip to talk about, and we're going to do a book review. And you're a winner, baby. And there's going to be a new winner as well. So sit back, grab your favorite drink, and we'll tell you our stories. Hello and welcome back. Bonjour mes amis et bienvenue encore une fois ici à Cabin Boy Nets. Do you realize that we passed our 100th episode? What? Yes, our last I episode. Mean, I, didn't, I didn't really realize that until I saw it posted. I had no idea because we don't count. We don't do episodes, you know, 69 or 72. No. We don't even do that. So, I don't know. I just thought, we've done a few. Yep, and you've been in most, well, I'd say you've been in a lot of them. <laughs> okay. Well, I hope so. Maybe that's why. Yeah. Maybe that's why it doesn't feel like a hundred. No. Anyway, that's a lot. Yes, and it is the summertime now, and we have been had a very busy spring. Part of the spring was visiting Topsy Farms to watch sheep shearing. One of my favorite farms, along with my other favorites, but Topsy, they're tops with me. So why don't we take a little look at the sheep farming? We should, because it's fascinating, and there's some wonderful people there doing wonderful things. So, we're very excited because we're on our way to Topsy Farm. We're on the Amherst Ferry, headed to Amherst Island. Guess what? It's springtime. You know what that means? Sheep are getting a haircut. Wool. standing in front of the house of a famous Canadian artist, Daniel Fowler. He came to Canada from England in the 1800s. He was a lawyer and then he decided to become an artist. He's known for his landscapes and his still life and his vibrant colors. And he's one of, he settled here on this farmstead in Amherst Island. He was also a member of the Royal Canadian Academy.
So what do you remember best about um, Topsy that day? Well, I know what you remember, but I'll, I'll talk about what I remember. <laughs> I remember a boy in a box, more on that. <laughs> I love watching it because I you don't realize how I love watching it. It I love watching the whole process because you oh, don't you don't what realize. Are you oh my about? gosh! Um, stop thinking about the farmer, and we will talk about the process. Just the how labor intensive it is f to actually um, do the shearing is quite exciting. But I will tell you, it we went over to Amherst Island to Topsy Farms, so we have to take a ferry over, and that's always exciting. I always love doing that. It feels, it really feels just the whole, I mean, it's not that long of a drive, but then when you get to the ferry, it just seems like you could be crossing any body of water and you feel like you're on a holiday, even yes. though it's just over there. Yeah. You feel like you're on this journey to an island and it's, it's always that ferry, like you say. You get excited just moving on towards the island. It's so beautiful and you feel like you're in another world. The ferry's on the ferry. Speak for yourself, <laughs> girl. Anyway, so it was great. So you get over to the island. It was a beautiful and day. Beautiful day. And it was perfect. It, there was a lot of people there. And, yeah, so we met, you know, Sally is there to meet and greet everyone. Yes. And, um, you know, it's it's open to the public. So they've got that, they probably, you could probably see, but there was that new viewing platform that they incorporated yes. and built, especially because, you know, if you crowd around, you crowd around, but now you've got a bird's eye view and there's a, a galley. That would you call it like a gallery yep. or a the second, gallery it was the, or a mezzanine? Up yeah, above. it was kind of like a mezzanine. Yeah, and you could walk up, and so there's there's you know it's still very intimate because you don't want to distract or disturb from what they're doing because it's very yeah. labor intensive, as you'll find out and that, as you can see. Um, well, I noticed that you're bursting at the seams to tell us what your favorite part of it was. So why don't you share? No, I thought it was fascinating because I had a conversation with with my friend um, Jake Jacob. Jay, um, who was in the wooden box, and what were they doing? What he was doing, I can't even talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so oh, Jake, Jake, um, it's so funny because he's having a conversation with me while he's, you know, they're they're filling, they're just dumping the fleece down the chute in the wooden box down the chute, and then they're going into those giant bags, but he's packing it down, and the only way to do that, it climbs into the device and it's like stomping I'm grapes. I'm just glad that I was holding the camera at the time. It's like stomping <laughs> grapes. And then, you know, it's funny because I said, are you are you sure you're wearing a belt on those pants? Because as he's hopping up and down, it was there was a lot of shifting going on. Um, but it was quite fascinating the wall, having a conversation <laughs> with, with someone in the middle. It looks like he's stomping grapes, but he's stomping yes. the fleece. Yeah. So it's, it's something you don't see every day. And you're thinking, what's going on down there? With the wool. Well, that's what he's doing, packing the wool into the bag. Just, just checking. Okay, I've got some. Like, who was there anything, was there anything that is, there some, is there somebody that you would think that, you know, somebody receives a bale of fleece, a great big, you know, great big yeah. bale of fleece. Huge. And you just think, okay, they just put it in the in the pouch, in the sack, in the... No, but the yeah, sort it. It's in a... Well, yeah, all of that first, but then they yeah. just get the thing. Do you know that that step of the process, you just think you, you put it in there? But it goes to the shoot. This is yeah. Cool. I thought it was kind of hysterical. It was almost comedic. Well, it was excellent. It was, it, it was, it was, well, I don't know if it was comedic. I mean, oh, but I thought it was poetry. I thought, I mean, or almost like a ballet. It was just, the, everything was chore beautifully choreographed. Well, I think it was ballet. gorgeous. I think it was ballet. It was the ballet. I think it's the ballet with the sheep. Because <laughs> the sheep ballet. They were dancing with those. I was astonished. You know, we, we've been to festivals where they do sheep shear, and I'm thinking, eh, so, you know. I've seen people get a haircut. You buzz the head, you know, army, shave the head. So how, how interesting would that be? When you think about it, if you, but most people wouldn't. You just think, oh yeah, buzz, buzz, off comes, off comes the wool. Yeah. But, oh my gosh, the muscle it takes and you're wrestling this. And they're just, they're, they're it's almost like a rag doll. They have it in their hands, but this beast is, could be over 200 pounds. Yeah, and they are gentle sure with the size of the sheep, sheep. but yeah. they are gentle, but... But the way they, you have to just be very aggressive in your, in your, you know, you know, you got to move it this way and then that way and then this way and gentle, but you have to be enough force and aggression to keep that. But they're right. just, they're just like, like, how do you say that? Like putty in their hands and they're just boom, boom, boom. And it was incredible. Um, and it is a ballet. It was a dance and there were two doing it at the same time. So you'd glance over at one and see 
they're very sim similar techniques, but you can see how smoothly they're both in sync. And it's like it's like a, a, a it's like I said, it's like a dancing with dancing with the sheep. Yeah, forget dancing with wolves. Dancing exactly. with exactly. Sheep. Yes. And are you Kevin? Does that make you Kevin Costner? I'm thinking more of Whitney Houston. Oh, that's a different. <laughs> that's movie. a different movie. <laughs> oh, that's a different movie. <laughs> She was in a movie with Kevin Costner. And right? I can't say that because I'm not. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to give you some sheep, sheep facts. Okay. How many sheep are in Canada, approximately? Does this still have to do with Topsy? Well, it will. It will have, we're getting into sheep shearing and, and all of that. Oh. Unless you had more to say about Topsy. Well, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> and Jacob. <laughs> Who? Okay. Who else was there? Okay, so there are a million sheep in Canada. Okay. Five million in the U.S. Yeah. Fifteen million in the U.K. Seventy-nine million in Australia. Oh gosh. Okay. And wow. hundred and seventy-five million in China. Oh gosh. Can you believe that? Well. Okay. So here's some sheer facts. Sheer facts. Sheer fact. Here are the sheer facts. Sheep were domesticated ten thousand years ago. Okay. And then they started shearing 3,500 years ago. How do you know that? I just know. And... Well, they went to had like how many electric sheep, cutters back then, I guess. No, in today... So these are today's numbers. So how many pe sheep, sheep do you think they can she a sheep shearer can shear in a day? <laughs> she sells, she sells. <laughs> she sells, she sells. Sell sell how many sheep can a sheep shearer shear in a, a, sheep, in a sheep shearer can sheep all day? I can't say that twice. <laughs> I can only say it once. <laughs> Um, okay, so what's the answer? Four, between 400 and 500 sheep. That well, is a lot. And an apprentice can do around 200. Okay, and they had, their numbers were in the 400s, I think, four to six, um, somewhere around there. That's crazy. Or do, we ha or do you remember the number? It was, it was a lot. Because I asked, I thought they were only at about 400, and I think um, when I stopped with Sally, they were, they were pushing, they're still pushing above 500 closer to six, something like that. For that day? Um, well, that's all of them. Oh, no, yeah, no. Yeah, no, they had more. For the whole... More. We actually have weekend. it in the clip when, For we, the weekend. when we filmed. Oh, okay. Yep, so... So, and then, and then what else? Yeah. Well, they, so, okay, so just imagine that. Between four and five hundred per day. <laughs> that's, the, that's the dog. He's oh, my gosh. The dog's having... A sheep having, nightmare. He's having, Zan. Zan's having nightmares. He's having a nightmare. What's that all about? Uh, there's probably a deer in the... Yard or something. Well, there was earlier. Okay, so, and they burn 5,000 calories. 5,000? 5, what? In a day. I'm going to the wrong gym. You're I going to the go, wrong gym. You need I to sheep go to topsy, I gotta go to the Topsy gym. And it takes, they can shear a sheep in two minutes. That's average. The, what do you think the world record is? Oh my gosh. Less than two minutes? Well, if the average is two minutes, the world record is probably less she than two minutes. She doesn't have a head. It hurts his brain. <laughs> She thinks, therefore, she am. Okay, come on, spit it out. What do you think? I don't know. 39 One, seconds. Oh, my gosh. Can you believe that? Did he miss, but did they miss a tuft here and there? Like it, around, around that's the incredible. inner thigh area, perhaps? And you can make between thirty-five and $75,000 a year as a sheep shearer. Holy smokes. Yeah, and it's but, roughly around $23 um, dollars so, an hour. Yeah, but... Depending and, on if you're experienced or not. You're working your butt off, literally, and you're getting fit at the same time. The benefit's getting fit, but not everybody thinks of it that way because who loves to do it? There are other ways to get fit without having, you know, exha exhaustion and perspiring to this. I would pass out the way yeah. uh, the way I could see them wrestling with one sheep after another, going through hundreds of sheep per minute, per couple of minutes. Um that's incredible. Yeah, and you want a good share. The, stamina, they want it, they the want stamina and the physicality of it all is absolutely incredible. And as I didn't say, was that I was blown away by the experience. Like I said, hmm, glad I could see somebody getting a haircut, a, a, a sheep. Oh my goodness. If you have the opportunity at whatever festival you may have, or you're going, or you have a nearby farm that's that's offering, you know, come on by, help or watch the sheep sharing. It's absolutely mind boggling because you have no idea until you see it with your own eyes. Even seeing it on, which I must have seen it online before, um, but I, I never appreciated it until I saw it 
live and in person. And they always, they're always looking for people to help um, sort and also... I did help. Didn't you see me? I did. And, and pick up the VM matter. I, the only thing I didn't do is I don't like being boxed in, so I didn't join Jake in the box. <laughs> Just, <laughs> please. I don't think Jake let you in the box. That's why you weren't in the box. <laughs> Can we just keep this family friendly? <laughs> anyway, that was our experience with sheep shearing, and it was fantastic. I agree with you. If you ever have the opportunity to go and watch sheep shearing, it's fantastic. Okay, and and then there, and, and also on one last note too. It, it it's a whole. I mentioned in ballet, absolutely right. There is a group doing this. There is a whole group of people with each of their own specific jobs. Um, I mean, even you know, even as you know, the sheep come. You know, you're two people shearing. It's not the sheep comes in one door. You let you let that sheep out. In they run into this cornered area, blocked off, boxed in again, and then boom, boom, buzz, 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 and then they just whoop, flap open this flap. Off it goes out into it could then venture out into the yard, and the next one in door shut, door open, door shut, all coordinated. Only at one point did somebody notice it very quick. Someone was on it. One of the one of the other gates that to keep them in had just popped open and someone automatically shear 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 pop this door pop that oh, on there because that whole group of sheep could have just just all that stampeded out and it would have been like oh my gosh let's go collect the sheep again so all very coordinated they know what they're doing and then the is it the sorting of the police when they were doing all of this that could have been that i was helping with they're sorting it that could have been a sheep shit show for sure Oh my God, there we go, the sheeps. Oh my gosh, yeah. Anyway, it's a coordinated effort by a group to make it happen. Yeah, and, and they, they did a did it phenomenal job. Incredibly well. Phenomenal. They've done it before. Okay, what's next? I don't know. Mail. We, we haven't talked about mail in a while. No. What did you get? Uh, a magazine. Okay. A magazine. The Knitter. And... We're matching cups today. Are we? Mm-hmm. Oh, this is the Hudson Bay. What are you drinking? I know the base stripes. I am drinking an iced matcha latte. Oh, look at you! I'm drinking an iced latte with a maple flavored coffee bean, which is absolutely delicious. Someone yeah. sometimes has a tendency to re-energize and get chatty on coffee. Oh my god! Oh, it, so that's not day. decaf. Not decaf today. Oh, but that means I have to put a warning on the bottom. Wait, watch. I have to put a warning on, on this, yeah. the bottom. <laughs> Viewers, Jim, beware. Jim put strap may, on your seatbelt. <laughs> experience turbulence and bl blubbering, blabbering, nonstop energy. <laughs> so this is the knitter. I'm not sure if that comes out. Yeah, I saw that. Okay, the knitter magazine. And the knitter. who is the knitter? This is from the UK. But who's the knitter? The knitter is the holder of the magazine. Okay. That's so it's like for the knitter or something. Yeah. So I've marked all of these. Oh. Pages. So there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Why are you going from the back to the front? Oh. I didn't mark the most important page. <laughs> well, I don't understand why you're going to the back if the first one's way up Well, there. if you turn to page... Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, I have to get this right. 71. 73. Good <laughs> I'm so glad I prepared for this. So if you turn to page 73. Um, because everyone down. at home has, everyone out there yes. it has the magazine in their lap. Yes, right now. so it's hand-dyed spring, indie yarns. Ah. Discover beautiful artisan yarns for your seasonal knitting from our favorite independent dyers. Okay. And if you turn to page 73, well, they don't have and go halfway down. I know, I'm just telling you in case they have access to it or, or they, they want online. to pick it up and then they want yes. to go to that. And they're going to make yes. note of getting the magazine at page 73. Yes. And Cabin Boy Knits is there. So we've got, we're. Oh, you didn't week. tell me that part. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm, like, so, <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to see. Okay, who are these special dyers? <laughs> oh. There's, oh. a lot, there's a lot of um, very um, good diaries. Did I not know that? Oh my gosh. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure I told you a few dozen times. But um, so anyway, there's a, there's a surprise me. So we're in the this edition, and I think we'll be in the next edition of the knitter. Okay. Well, the thing is, when you know you got mail, it's his mail. So oh, sorry, we I got don't. Mail. I don't open it. It's his mail. It was so he hogs it, especially <laughs> if it's candy. You know, that's not true. So there's the magazine. It may have been sitting there for a week and a half or two until he says, Oh, you might want to read this. 
Um, and oh, by the way, hmm. okay, well that's that's really yeah. impressive. And what about there's how, also how things of value in the magazine as well. What <laughs> about what about I mean, there are a bunch of others. Are there any other yeah. that that you know stand out for you? Or oh my gosh, I missed the I just uh, got away from the page. I think they were all. You like to check them out. Um, there, well, a lot of them I don't know. Over. Here's the wonderful thing about it. I don't know most of these dyers. Well, this pretty is... much all of them, which is great because they're all from the UK or from other parts of the world, and okay. so I don't I don't know them, and so I'm really happy. Well, that... this is the thing when you get a book or a magazine, it's it's all about informing and learning. So you're 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 learning, and and some of them might be fascinating. You might want to touch touch base yep. with some of them and reach out and go, hey, we're dyers too, and yeah, learn, learn from them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are some interesting articles in here as well, and some mm -hmm. great patterns, but. One of the interesting articles I found was by Graham Bethune, um, and he's a sheep farmer in in the UK. Yeah. And he's fumbling his way through sheep farming, and or he's learning as he goes along. Seriously. And how many times have we heard that story where well, people have like, bought sheep? Sounds like and, the gainers to me. And we're trying to trying to figure this thing out or feel the way out. So he was trying to figure out the right size, and he had a he basically was putting off a major decision in his life. And it was, he's got a bunch of sheep okay. and different types of sheep. And he's had to decide whether or not he wanted to be meat producer or wool. Oh. And his heart was kind of with the wool. Well, but he never, want, he, he didn't want to commit to make that decision because it's a big risk. And so. Well, okay, I have, and, I have my head is swimming so just a second. questions. Yeah, so that now he's trying to figure out, so he's, we still don't know what's happening to him. Um, so this will be, hopefully they'll continue on with his story. Um, well, what do you mean? That's the story. He's not sure what to do. Well, it was really the story was I found really interesting because when you think about a sheep farmer, <laughs> there's going to be a sequel. Unless there you might even be a unless you talk to them sometimes or a prequel, but a trilogy, a trilogy. So it like normally it's I thought it was really interesting because he's very vulnerable in this article okay. and he's sharing well, his being humanity honest, obviously. and he's being very honest and okay. I, th I that's what I loved about this article. I thought it was great it and I'm be, really interested to find out what happens next. Well, it might be a quadrilogy. Could be, yeah. Okay, so so that, that's the story. Does it say what kind of sheep he has? He has a bunch of them. I didn't highlight it uh, when I read the article. Well, well, that would be interesting because we know a little bit about a lot of things, a lot of sheep. So, you know, it's one thing to just, you just purchase sheep with not sure in mind. But, you know, as we know, some are better meat producers than wool producers. The wool being a byproduct, wool could be used for anything. As we know, a lot of the... The coarser wool can be used for outerwear. A lot of it goes, you know, towards spinning or carpets and different functions. Yeah. But if you specifically want wool, um, you know, there are sheep that you could choose from to have a wonderful warm wool. Most of them are all wonderful. Um, yes, Cheviot, do you know what I mean? You yes, make those Cheviot, choices. Castle milks, Cheviots. Um, Cheviot, that's an old And I think he's got a couple of others as well. Yep. But like you say, all the byproducts, plus if they're going to, you know, if he... If they interbreed, you could come up and have some fascinating, really good wool. Yep. Just from the mixes, because, well, we talk about sheep breeds and how and how you get a better wool. So there are ways that he can produce. He can have an offspring that has wow, that has a really great fleece, and he could then, you know, continue breeding that one or two sheep and have this incredible wool. Yes. With a, with a blend. Yeah. Yep. So we'll see what happens. We'll have to stay tuned. I was really excited about another article in here. Okay. Mayak. Oh, yes. And we met Paula um, at the Knit City in Montreal a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And she runs, um, along with um, Andrea, who, Andrea, who, uh, they both run uh, Mayak. And what a fascinating story this is. It, it is, is, is so fascinating. Yes, I, it is a fascinating story. And now... What's interesting is I remember reading this story, but I didn't remember that we had a little thingy in there. <laughs> yes. Oh, so hold even, on, hold on. Let me say, so you picked there. up the magazine. I read this. You read, I you read the history this book. Well, he didn't look at her. He didn't look at her. <laughs> I forgot that it was in there, or maybe you mentioned it, but it was. I wanted to read about this because we had, we had just come back from Knit City and we met her, and I I remember her from before this yeah. article, so I remember the story because Mayak is. Yeah. And Devin I'm interviewed saying, her as well, Mayak. It is Mayak, yeah. which stands for? Uh, well, it's affiliated with the, the yaks. So they basically, right. they basically comb 
the end um, of, of, the, of the yak and the baby yaks and then they take that and they also have cashmere sheep as well. So this all happens in Tibet. Uh, and so they've been working, I think for 20 years, they've been working with the, uh, or, or living with and uh, periodically visiting yeah. the um, nomadic tribes in Tibet. And they s started, they came up with an idea of, why don't we, you've got a fantastic resource right mm -hmm. here. We can do something with this. And so they take that, they pay above market value for the, um, for the fiber, and then they send it to Italy, and it's milled at a fantastic mill in Italy, and they make gorgeous, gorgeous yarn. And and that's you know, they like to do it, and also they're being very, um, what's the word? Just being very environmentally friendly about yes. it, and they're being that's very sensitive to the um, to the history and to their their ongoing. What this is what they've done forever, but they've helped uh, they've helped establish more of an economy there uh, by doing exactly what they do and employing these people and doing things in the way that they've done it for generations because they've they've had yaks they've been doing this for a long time but they're able to help each other in 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 different ways yeah one being a prosperous prosperous e economically viable um functioning farms and going from the tribes and and getting the wool and and doing it in a way uh, that they've been doing it for centuries, but then bringing in the, as they fly this sheet, this fleece to Italy and it's spun there to create, like you say, a wonderful yarn. So yep. it's a very, very fantastic um, cooperation between the two cultures. Yeah, and I was I was thrilled to see that the article was in the Knitter magazine. Yeah, yeah, and when you and when you read the article in depth, you really get a feel for exactly what it is they're doing, and it's all very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, and I I don't like having regrets in life, but one of my regrets was why, I why, I was why is it regret? I was no well, let me let, let me finish my sentence and then I'll tell you and then you can tell me if you still don't Take know. Take a sip of your coffee. <laughs> why don't you, there you go. Why don't you have a sip of your coffee, and if you don't if I don't clearly articulate it by the end of the sentence, then ask me the question, and that is that during Mid City I didn't spend a lot of time going to all the booths, so I did not pick up any Mayak yarn. Uh, Mid City. So I went to my favorite, one of my favorite Toronto local yarn shops. Mm -hmm. You knit, you knit and crafts, and where's um, that? That's. <laughs> I'm glad I said mine and not our favorite <laughs> yarn shop. Thank you. <laughs> what am I missing here? No, it's between Christie and Ossington on Bloor. Or I've not been there. You, no, oh, yeah, haven't you been there? I don't know. I, I guess Christ I don't. I don't Christy take you to and Oddsington. Yeah, I, I guess I don't take you to I've the finer places there. in Toronto. No. Anyway, it's a fantastic yarn shop, and we are going to be interviewing them shortly, so I'll keep this to a minimum. But um, I went in, and Claudia was there, the owner, mm -hmm. and I said I told her about the knit, knit, the Knitter magazine, Mayak, and I'm looking for Mayak yarn, and so she has a connection oh. to Paula. Okay. And Mayak. And she said, can you wait for a few minutes? I'm going to go to my house and pick something up for you. What? And so and then, I bought this and one. And then? And then what happened? Well, yakety yak, bring that back. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh my gosh, we are just ringing up the dad jokes today. So, so Mayak what? gave her a bunch of these yarns. Wow. And so she um, handed them to me. and Because I, I said we were going to be talking about Mayak yarn today. And I was these wondering are what, gorgeous. I was wondering what was sitting in that bag for all these days. Yes. And so what makes... Here's what I love about their yarn. Okay. Other than the softness, which is incredibly soft. I don't know. I've never touched it. Here, touch that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's oh. Incredible. But the other thing is the wow. colors. The colors are great. Do you know why the colors are the way the colors are? Because they're dyed. But what they don't do is they don't bleach out any color in when they're processing the yarn. What do you mean and so, out? well, some yarns when you get a white yarn, they want it to have a clear white base. Yes. You will uh, sometimes use chemicals to bleach out the yarn to um, to alter the color prior a little bit to? prior to dyeing. And so they don't do that. They use the natural, natural, natural yarn color, and then they will just dye over that. Just it's over like, the natural yarn. Yeah, as, as, it's like, as, as we do sometimes when we um, find we bases we like. Time. Well, yeah, I mean, we never bleach, but I'm just saying, like, when we dye over yarn, that's one, I guess that's one of the things that attracts me to it, that we do the same thing, and it looks 
I love the look of it. I, I, I think it looks great. Well, the colors, these, these, super soft. these look like they could be colors we could do naturally, all natural. Oh, for sure. This blue is absolutely incredible. It's gorgeous. Because blue is my favorite color. Yeah. Sometimes pink is too, but blue has always traditionally been my favorite color. But that blue is incredible. I got this blue because I thought it would make your eyes pop. Oh. Does that mean I'm going to knit myself a pair of glasses with it and make it see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can make yourself um, a toque. So it's what, beautiful. What do you think? What, so would the, this. what would have been used on this to create that blue? You mean other than the dye? So to, to, this is called Tibetan Cloud. Our wool comes exclusively from an ancient breed of sheep that roam freely on the grassland of the Tibetan Plateau at an altitude of over 4,000 meters. Out of a deep respect for animal welfare, the sheep are sheared by nomads in the traditional way that has been used for centuries. Tibetan cloud is the result of using the finest and softest perth of that wool, creating a yarn that is exceptionally light and soft, sliding across your hands as clouds that float across the Tibetan sky. Well, it feels like a cloud. It is gorgeous. But, this is, but you mentioned the yak, but this is a sheep. Yeah, yeah. So the sheep and yeah. yak, and you also said cashmere. Cashmere, yep. yep. Which are goats. Just gorgeous. My this legs. is stunning. Cashmere, yes. goats. Yeah. Because some people didn't, you know, some people don't necessarily know all of that. Because when you think of a sweater, if, you know, if, if you're not a fibrous and you're out shopping and you buy a mohair sweater or you buy a cashmere sweater, you don't yeah. really think what the animal is. I would assume, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume, because this is just me, I would have just thought that they're, they're all a different kind of wool. Because that's, I think, growing up, you think a mohair sweater is just a fuzzy woolly sweater. A cashmere is the softest of soft wool, but you don't realize, you know, mohair. Right. Rabbit. <laughs> And then the cashmere, goat, and then you know there's yak, there's there's camel, there's, there's a lot of different fibers awesome. that go. Yeah, a camel coat. Well, I think a camel coat. You know when you're buying it, it's camel. They'll say it's camel. Yeah. So you know that that's not a sheep or it's not wool. It's camel. Um, but everything else, when you just say cashmere, mohair, merino, most people bunch that in the same category. If they're not knitters or fibrous, they would just the average person. I'm just making that assumption. Anyway, these colors right. are beautiful, and this this is a super super soft. This is very very soft. They're gorgeous. I'll put the the name underneath, but um, check out my ex uh, website. It's it's quite interesting. Yeah. What's next? The next th item is our whip summer whip. So I have had my eye on a tank top, and I wanted to knit a tank mm -hmm. top, and so I was looking for patterns. I've got a couple of patterns I've collected now, and so the first one I picked is called a hot mesh the hot mesh tank i hope it's not a hot mesh by kevin Haggerty. it doesn't look like a hot mesh and i lo I, I love the look of this one it's oh gorgeous. i see not a hot mess it's a big hot mess i not <laughs> no it's very hot looking mesh yes but i was a hot mess when i first started knitting it because i was oh. outside and talking to people there's only four only four rows you have to and two of them are knit rows so it was it's pretty it's it's a great pattern because it's very easy to remember um okay. so it's easy to turn the hot mess into a hot mesh so anyway i've been knitting this, this. like on words the whole <laughs> so i've been knitting this this is like i didn't follow the i mean i followed the pattern but um i used different needles for this i've used not different well i didn't sorry different, what am I saying? i've used no i've used the same needles i used different um, yarn. So they they call for a sport weight yarn, and I am using a fingering yarn. Okay. And but I'm using the same size needles. That's not a huge. Is there a huge difference? Well, it, it gives me bigger holes, and I love. That, you know how I, I love. I already hole. figured that out. So I this figured is, that out. So this because is because I thought you want it to be messier. I do. So <laughs> I want the holes. Not messy. Messier. 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 Like mesh, but more of the mesh. Love. So this is my swatch so far, and um, I know I messed up on the on the rows, like on rows two and four, um, but it's my swatch. Mm. So okay. we'll see what happens. I'm going to measure this, and then measure it out, and then I hope to have this cranked out in, in a week. 
I think. It's not going to take that long. Okay. But I'm quite excited to wear it. The only thing I did similar was that when I when I was doing that vest for Knit City as per, um, part of a theatrical costume yes. or a knitted garment, I all I did was I used, like you said, I used a thin yarn. Well, I used the same yarn as the fleece that I had. And I just used really fat needles. I forget the size. They're about the size of my finger. They were really fat. So it just created big holes as opposed to doing, which almost looks like it's crocheted really. Cause crochet yeah. seems well, a couple of people, the, the, we were in a public place and I was knitting around the pool and a couple of people asked me if I was crocheting. See, and this is the thing, but I, what I like differently about this is because it's a technique, I could see the difference with the rows um, there's a thickness around each hole. There's a, actually, you could see more of a pattern as opposed to mine just being one single, one single um, thread of yarn yeah. per hole. They were very, very flimsy. This has a little more structure to it, yeah. which I like. Yeah, so I'm, and the pattern's great. It's recommended for intermediate knitter. And um, again, for basically for... Um, lines basically that you need to know okay. two of them four, are rows. Needed, four rows thing. now would i would i be considered intermediate yes now? you can definitely handle this you've, you've you've done a sweater um you made a dress you've done the, yes you can i have like a hat pattern that i designed you have your here. hat pattern which is going to be going up live and by the end of the year <laughs> i'm gonna get that thing together you are yes but will I remember, i'm excited will i even remember how i did it I yes because i've done like what six of them five and you'll need test them. knitters as well Test knitters. Yeah. Yes. So you'll be looking for test knitters. And and did we did we put in that order for that yarn? Um, we're going to talk we about that. To, we oh, have we we'll check our we'll inventory. We'll talk about it at the time. Yeah, but I'm quite excited about that. Because I think it's like a super Jamie's bulky, premier super chunky. pattern. Yeah. Yes. So that's it. So highly recommend this so far. Love it. Um, can't wait to show you the end product. And Kevin yep. Haggerty. And I didn't say most importantly, if you can't find him on, he's on Ravelry, but he is Pearl Jam. So Pearl. Um, underscore underscore jam which is a great name for knitter as well so okay. really excited about that and what we talked about was I wanted to do a vest as well because I wanted to do one for myself but originally I was doing it for my my BFF well my BFF in my mind for my BFF Harry not to be mistaken with the other Harry but Harry Styles oh. because he likes knitted garments and don't tell him but I'm planning on knitting a vest that I'm hoping he'll wear and will you have it in time for when you're in England and you can personally well, go there's drop an it idea. off to them? Well, there's an idea. That's a great idea because when I knitted this thing, um, yeah, because the larger needles, I, I, I whipped that together in no time. So the vest I have in mind is a V-neck, but I'm just, you just have to just Google something that I have in mind. I have a pattern that I thought I would use and I, I thought I would do like I would do have a, like I've done with other projects where I just kind of make it up myself as I go kind of following a pattern but not at all so I was wondering if I could use that technique with those rows on the other v-neck as opposed to because yours is yeah. gonna be yours is gonna be For like sure a tank top Absolutely. isn't it yours is like a tank yes and I want to do a, a low cut oh you can easily do that yes and I'm thinking when you're doing the v I've never done a v before so when you're doing a v-neck um I, I just figure if you want it longer, you just carry it on or something. Yeah. I don't know. I'll figure and it so out. And so how are you going to take measurements of Harry? Are going to guess? Oh, he's my size. <laughs> <laughs> I can just tell by his physique he's my size. It's, it's I gonna, think he'd fit perfectly. It, it's going to fit him. I could tell. I could tell. It will fit him like a glove. It's going to fit him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I do have a direct link to him so in that's, my mind. So, so that's say, Jamie's. Harry, way. what's your size? What size <laughs> do I need to do across shoulders? It's going to fit him. Anyway, so that, that is our summer whips. Thank you yeah. for sharing. Sharing and my, is caring. And then that's my summer whip. It's in my mind is that vest. And then I have another couple of in my mind projects I haven't started yet that need to be done for Rhinebeck. But that's till the fall. But I need to start it now. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, finished with the whips. <laughs> no, I didn't want to even talk. I don't even have a whip. Okay. Ready for our next item, which is a book review. A book review. We're going to do a full book review. We're going to talk about this book. We're going to talk about this book. And so let's talk about the very beginning before we even got to the book. Okay. We were at Kitchener Waterloo Festival last year. Oh, that was year. a while back. Was it last year? Mm -hmm. And I saw a beautiful display of yarn. Um, and I saw the sign Story Maker. And I thought, this, has, this is what's going on in this. I was fascinated by this booth. 
different from all of the other booths. Really, really interested. Well, the story part was what fascinated me because you thought, oh, Jamie is not the only one who has a story to tell. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm attracted to you because of your storytelling. And I like all story. Everybody makers. knows about my storytelling because yes. I've always got a story to tell. They do. My, even my dad will say that. Jamie, tell me a story. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I've, tell, I've probably told, I mean, I was going to say hundreds. It seems like hundreds, but it's not. Um, oh, more. Okay. Yeah. And, and to come up, every now and again, I come up with a new story because it just takes one little something, one little something I see, some word I hear, or someone mentions something, and then it'll be a story that I forgot all about. I go, oh my gosh. And it's always relatable to somebody mentioning something. And most of them are true. They're all true stories. They're, they're unbelievably um, true. Yes, they are. Okay, so back to Rebecca Hoy. So Rebecca and... I mean, sorry, Alexis Hoy. <laughs> Who's Rebecca? Okay, back to Alexis Hoy. Okay. The author of the book, Storymaker. So we went over, had a chat with her, mm -hmm. and fascinated by her booth, and um, heard the whole story about the Storymaker. And I thought, I have to find out about this. We always, I'm always looking for interesting knitting books. And whether they're vintage pattern books or we have a book, um, a former roller derby uh, person, a uh, woman who uh, wrote a book and created patterns for a roller derby crowd. Uh, I was like, interesting, different books. And this one yeah. is super interesting. It's a fairy tale, or fable. Um, and so how it's structured is there's a story uh, on the title on the front of it it says an illustrated book of knitting fiber and fable and so she and it also says a hand spun yarn about the intangible elements of making tangible things and so okay. there's this there's a story that goes on and in each chapter there is a pattern and the and patterns are fantastic. To the story. And, and the, relates to the story. patterns relate to the story. And so I was reading, I, I read parts of it and, and some of the stories. And I think that this, does this, is the story continuous all the way through? Yes. Or, or yeah. is there, because if you would just read one chunk in itself, it seems like it could be a story in itself, but it's always follows the next step or the next, almost like a, yeah. soap opera where it is continuous it goes from there to there well it's a journey there. and it's a journey a journey that's a good way to put it the main character is on a journey because it's not all about no. drama it's a very 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 good read as well so Rowan the main character she is trying to save her family um, and she lives on an isolated mountaintop and she goes on a, a journey to basically save um, save her family and there's yarn she knits on the way through and there's a it, there's knitting throughout and it's closely linked to the patterns and the patterns reflect what's going on in the story which I think is fantastic but there's a learning component there's a learn but but yeah and so the, but the thing is I've got my we'll go through some of the patterns that I'm will be knitting. well not only learning because you learned into the pattern I mean the storyline has where she's yeah, but, but well, yes. So, but what I was going to say Where was... The characters learning from... Yes. So when you're knitting a pattern, though, you'll be thinking about the chapter that you just read. Right. Which I think is really good. But she... So just, just that on its own would be exciting enough for me. But she takes it up a notch. This brings this book to the next level. How and that, that? that is... She mentions the sheep. So not only okay. she mentions the fiber that's being used, and she had fiber that was made for this fairy tale. And she talks about the sheep breeds that were used, or the fiber that was used in, to create these, and um, to, to create the yarn. And where and she, so we met her down at Kitchener Waterloo. Yeah, she down in that area. She's in Guelph. She's yep. in Guelph, which is just near London, Ontario, or no, not close to London. On your way between Toronto and London, but so yeah, Guelph, yeah, Hamilton, yeah, close Guelph, enough. Guelph yep. University, yeah, Southern Ontario, Guelph. Yeah. So, and, and I love that. Like, when do you open up a pattern book and they talk about the breeds of sheep? Yeah. So that and, was pretty amazing. And also, those breeds of sheep are all very local. Yes. Which yep. is really interesting and fantastic as well. Yeah. She knows exactly where they come from, just here, there, just around the immediate and surrounding areas. Yeah. 
And, and the patterns really do reflect the story. It's not just that she had an inventory of items or that she wanted to put in, she mapped, put it into the book. They really do reflect the story, which is, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. And I think not only will you be thinking about the, pair, the chapter when you're knitting this, but when you're wearing them, I think you'll also think of the story as well. You'll remember the story so it's, for I'm sure. I'm getting goosebumps now. Yeah. Look at my goosebumps. My I know, goosebumps. you could. It's you so could, exciting. Yeah, you could just, yeah, you could digest the story that you just read. And it, you're right. When you when you if you're wearing that garment afterwards, you'll remember that story because that's the pattern you followed. And yeah. You, and you followed the storyline. And yeah. so she used different fibers for the different patterns, and she also used different weights as well. So we have different breeds of sheep, different fiber, and um, different weights. The first one that I'm going to knit is the Affinity mittens. I love the look of these. They look great. I like it. That looks yeah. like a Christmas gift. And they used, on this one, it was Fiber Sisters yarn, 40% Polypay um, from Orangeville, Ontario, 30% Alpaca from Belleville, which is 10 minutes down the road, um, and 30% Mohair from um, Alora, Ontario. So Alora, the Alora Gorge, very famous. There's an old mill there, the Alora Mill. We've been there before. There used to be, I think there, there was a yarn shop. Is it still going? So Alora, again, in southern Ontario, beautiful, beautiful hike down those um, where the rapids are and the falls, the Alora Gorge, um, beautiful area. And then Orangeville, which is north of Toronto, would you say? North? Yep. Northeast? North, northwest. Northwest of Toronto yep. and Belleville, just around the corner. And the poly paste sheep and the blend. Yeah, you mentioned it's all, so the yarn is story maker yarn um, because they're blends specifically for her projects. Yep. So, so that was a DK. Um, the next one is. Do you want me to talk a bit about that one? About which one? The poly pay. Oh sure, I sure. Really yeah, no, no. I was so excited about the patterns. So you go ahead. Do and you want to do that, and then we'll talk about them, or do we? Are no, do talk about the poly pay now because we're we're on the affinity mittens, okay. and it goes, and then the affinity mittens are knit with poly pay. Okay. Now I went over three sheep breeds, and the poly pay is now. Okay, so. The poly pay, as you mentioned, it's a blend of um, the poly pay, the alpaca, and the mohair. The poly pay was developed in the 1960s in the U.S. Now, I'm going to start with the name because this, the name basically describes the yarn, poly because, pay. Because I guessed and you said that I, that's not right. I, I, would, I thought it was from Polworth. That would make yeah, sense. Yeah, no, no, the name is completely, I couldn't understand. I thought Polypay, I've never heard of Polypay, which is interesting because it's, it's quite popular. But it was developed in the, in the um, U.S. in the 1960s. And the reason being, they, they wanted to come up with a breed of sheep that would be, you know, a sort of fast producing, fast breeding, um, have a good uh, wool, dual purpose or multi-purpose. Um, dual purpose specifically, and they also used poly, which means multiple, so multiple different sheep breeds, and poly pay. I'm going to explain it. So you have a combination of Finn, Rambouillet, Targhee, and Dorset. So let's start with the Finn. The Finn is from Finland, and it's known because they could produce three to five offspring. Keep that in mind, three to five offspring, multiple births. Now, also, I mentioned um, the Dorset. The Dorset is one of the sheep breeds that was, um, we'll talk about the Dorset after because there's another one with Dorset, but there's Dorset in here. And that also, it's one of the UK breeds that, um, one of the very few that has lambing season throughout the winter and also in the spring. So again, multiple births because mm -hmm it lambs a couple of times a year. The Rambouillet, because it's a very adaptable sheep. And the Rambouillet, French Merino, softness of the wool. And then the Targhee, which is interesting because this is developed in the, in the United States and the Targhee is a very American breed as well. We've covered it before, named after the Targhee Forest, Targhee National uh, named after the store. Forest in Idaho. Mm -hmm. Named after the store. Yeah, oh no, that's Tarjay. Tarjay. That's Tarjay. Tarjay in Canada. That's Tarjay. Although it didn't last very long. In that, that went bust real fast. But the Targhee has been prolific and it's very popular sheep. 
And you know what's interesting about the Targhee? Okay, it's named after the National Forest in Idaho. Okay, so the Targhee has, okay, here we go, because I already mentioned Rambouillet, but the Targhee is a breed with Rambouillet, Corydale, which Corydale is a Merino and a Lincoln Longwell, and Lincoln Longwell. That's the Targhee. So let's get back to that. Targhee already has those yep. fine components. Lincoln Longwell, Rambouillet, Corydale, again, Rambouillet, Lincoln Longwell. So there's a lot of softness there. So what they did was they bred the Finn and the Rambouillet first, because there's four. So Finn and Rambouillet, they bred offspring. Targi and Dorset, is that what I said? Targi and Dorset. Yeah. Targi and Dorset, offspring. Then a couple of years go by because they wanted, it's, um, what do you call that? Selective breeding to get these really good uh, offspring here. Then it wasn't, this was, like I said, early 1960s. Now, 1970, they're developing the actual breed because now they took the best of this, this offspring and this offspring. Now the four combined and they have the polypay with the four combined using the four. Now you've got the four breed mixed in and you get the polypay. Then this is 1970. So 1975, they came up with the polypay because poly, multiple, multiple births. Polyamorous. Polyamorous, multiple births because there's a number of offspring. And also um, I mentioned the other sheep that um, not only are they, you know, they, they birth a couple of times a year, like the Dorset, um, the, uh, Oh gosh. Also, they come to puberty more often, like quicker, quicker so they can yeah. start birthing in the first year. So all these combination seems to me poly pay, and it's all about the payout in the end. The payout, because you got multiple births, and the payout in the end is that you've got a couple of components that with the wool, so you got a yearly crop of fantastic wool, which is a medium, a medium to soft wool because of the rambouillet, and also you get um, double whammy with the double births. So you've got that to look forward to because you're producing more sheep, they're producing faster, and they're a dual purpose meat and wool. And that's the poly pay. Wow, I never, would never have guessed. Poly pay, multiple payouts. So wow. basically with bonuses in the end. Hmm. Interesting. I thought that one was fascinating because okay. it is because that's not because you know what I was kind of threw me off a little bit because I was not I thought I thought to myself why because I'm not understanding because I didn't understand this polypay and even the name because every other sheep you have like you know every other sheep combination you have a sheep breed with a combination of the sheep name and I thought polypay that's not a sheep what is that but so it serves its purpose because you've got this. It's all about, I guess yeah. with this one, it's about fast breeding, boom, pop those lambs, out, pop, 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 pay, pay, pay. You make money and you also get a good product. But it's kind of a, it almost seems like a, I don't know. You make your own assumptions. Poly pay sheep. It's just like a polyester sheep. Put it that way. Poly pay. Kind of a made up breed with a mix, but... Yeah. With one purpose in mind, really. Yeah, but I, I just, was, I'm but just saying was, on that. But bread, but bread with some great sheep. I mean, those sheep in, in themselves are individually wonderful, fantastic breeds. Um, and, and like I said, the, we'll talk about the Dorset because there's another Dorset that'll come up. So we'll get in depth with that. What I was going to say was, with respect to the name, it's not that's not the normal naming convention for sheep. That's why I thought it was so odd. Mm -hmm. Well, now I see why. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So the most, other one, if we great. use the same yarn, we can use the same yarn to knit this fantastic mountain range hooded shawl, which is really cool. Okay. And it's the same yarn. Oh. That's the same yarn. Um, um, there's socks that will look, this, this looks like a great Christmas gift too, the socks. Oh, I like those. Those, yeah, are, those are fantastic. Uh, slipper socks, and they are made with uh, dorset. Cooperworth Wool from Simcoe, Ontario. Okay. And um, these would be really nice. The um, the lady land the land ladies fingerless gloves are gorgeous. I like those. These are um, Tally's uh, Forest Flock, eighty five percent Norbelay, 
wool from Norwood, which is just 30 minutes that way, um, and silk. And they are gorgeous. Really, really nice. And the percentage is 85 Norwood Nor yeah. Lay and 15% silk from India. Yeah. And again, the Nor Boulet, of course, I'm, this is just a guess because Nor Boulet comes from Norwood, Boulet, Ram Boulet. So it's got to be a combination of Ram Boulet with beautiful soft merino wool with probably one of their local sheep that they, they had on hand. It is. And they called it the Nor Boulet, which is great because why not? Well, it's, I met the shepherdess at one of the festivals and I asked mm -hmm. her about that specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And her, her wool is phenomenal. Just, just really nice. Um, and so the, the, here's the other one, Mantle of Fidelity. And so I was looking at Mantle this, of and I usually don't gravitate towards There's a story. Shawls There's a story or there. Race. Um, and so I was looking at it, and I thought, you know, I, I'm not really, I, I do knit shawls every so often, but, um, and this is lace weight too. And it's it's just stunning. Like, look at the, that is just gorgeous. So I'm looking through it, and I, and I thought, I didn't even notice this at all. When I was mm -hmm. reading all this, I think because I was more interested, I was interested in the um, what sheep breeds were there and and this the weight of the wool and all that stuff. I didn't notice the model, which I love. I love you didn't the fact the fuzzy face. I love the fact that she has a guy modeling this because you you don't see that too often. I mean, Stephen West, you'd always see Stephen West in his shawls, right. but when you see, when you're looking at shawls, especially lace shawls like this, you don't normally see guys in. It. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, but it's great. a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous um, show. Yeah. Was there any other breeds that you wanted to talk about in here? Yeah, well, why don't you find a pattern with the, there was a Dorset Coopworth. Yeah, right here. So the Beech Leaf Mittens has 100% Dorset Coopworth wool from Simcoe, Ontario. So Simcoe, okay, that's what I was trying to check. So Simcoe, Ontario, which is just north north of Barrie. So north of Toronto is Barrie, and Barrie, you have like a very large lake, Lake Simcoe, just up there. Yep. So go for it. Well, okay. So the door. So it says Dorset Coopworth 100% blend. So yep. It's probably 50 50 if they're calling it. So the Dorset sheep is a traditional old breed sheep from the south of England. Um, it's the horned Dorset, uh, which was the original sheep. Now they say that it's been around for centuries. They also mention, and this is where the history, I'm not sure exactly, but it says that it's possibly bred with the merino way back when. But if it's centuries old, Merino wasn't available to other countries until the late 1700s through King Charles IV of Spain. So until that that Merino made its way to, to England, Great Britain, um, possibly if that's when the Dorset was developed, but they said it was around for centuries. So older sheep with a local bread, possibly with a Merino, not sold on it, um, with one of the horned breeds from the area. Um, and as I mentioned, that Dorset sheep, it was one of the most... Um, it became one of the most popular sheep by the 1800s and it uh, as i mentioned one of the only ones in the uk that would breed throughout the winter and spring so it could breed a couple of times a year um what else about the dorset oh and so the dorset was also um then 1800s it's also exported to the u.s and by somewhere around 1950 they started um there was uh what do you call that a mutation they found on their sheep farm and the sheep had no horns, so a polled sheep. And so they started um, developing that sheep because the, you think about sheep and with horns, I mean, if they're not friendly to you, you don't want these things coming at you. So um, polled sheep seemed, uh, you know, became popular at the time. So they developed the polled. So now there's the, it's, it's a, a, a verifiable breed developed in the 1950s. So you have the original horned, Dorset, which is an at risk because, of course, the polled Dorset became much more popular. And it's a dual purpose sheep and it has a uh, very good wool as well. And then I'm going to mention as well the um, oh, the other thing that's great about it is it has between 20, oh, what is it, 23 and 35, 25 and 35 microns, but also it's completely white, so it's great for dyeing. And the Coopworth now that was developed in New Zealand in the 1950s and 60s and it's bred with the it was bred with the uh, Border Lester and the British Romney they were both imported into New Zealand um, and they developed that in the 50s and 60s and what else do I want to say about that one let me see 
So 50, oh yeah, so Border Lester, Lincoln Longwell, dual purpose, as I mentioned, and oh, so the new breed, the Coopworth, which is a long wool because of the of the border, um, the border Leicester is a long wool sheep from Britain. So it became the most, the second most popular sheep after the Romney. The Romney was quite popular at the time, and then that became the second most popular. And it was shipped off to the exported to the U.S. in the 1970s. So again, good for dyeing. The wool was great, great for outerwear, very good fleece in itself. Excellent. So the only thing I would just challenge you on, on this. Yes. And tell challenge me, I, I'm, is I'm doing three sheep and the Norwood. Yeah, no, no. Right? Is is just that right, right. Um, it says 100% Dorset hyphen Coopworth. So based on the fact that they Wait have it hyphenated, I would think that the sheep... Dorset is the I, most the prominent? I, I, would, I would say that they probably have an offspring, so they put Dorset and Coopworth together, and the offspring is... The offspring so i think that okay. this wool is from the offspring so it's not a blend they have a dorset coop dorset yeah because normally when they have dorset and coopworth oh, you'd have 20 percent okay, okay dorset, well, then that would explain percent coopworth so, so that's what i'm thinking so with the coopworth i think the coopworth because the coopworth has the long wool in it so if you think about it we talk about breeds. so the coopworth has the the, the border lester long wool yeah and it's already a great place where and the dorset remember i mentioned the dorset breeding the breeding they, they use the Dorset. I was talking about that in the last breed. Yep. With the poly pig yep. because of the Dorset. They added they added two three two three breeds that were known for their um, like I mentioned the Finn, which is a great milky and that was like when it has more than dual purpose, it's known for the fleece, which is a very fine fleece. It's known because of the milk productivity and also for the birthing multiple births. Right. So the Dorset with that you could see how you could blend the Dorset, just the Dorset, and the Coopworth to create a sheep that would have fantastic wool, but then the birthing season is longer, so you have more births. Right. And so the flock could grow Excellent. a quicker. So overall, love, love, love the book. I think it's great. One thing we didn't mention is Alexis also did the illustrations in the book. Oh, like how talented is she? Oh, I like that's I pretty incredible. I didn't even either. that's pretty I didn't incredible. Know that or don't, I didn't remember that part. Yeah. So um, yeah, and there's illustrations throughout this book as well. And so you think, yeah, you think about it. Somebody doing a book, a book amazing. of patterns. Okay, <laughs> a, a book of original patterns, original yarns. The yarn blends are made specifically for that. And then she um, also mentions from what I read. What did she she mention? Like. Um, to con like you contact her or maybe you could go to these places directly because to have that exact yarn to use I mean small small crop yarn I can make um, it that easier were, that were blends specifically and they're called makers story makers yarns like they're her yep. yarns but I think did she say that she has replacements that you could substitute perhaps um, yeah so I just don't want to go along the first thread that you had um, the, th the first yarn that you were t you stringing Mm -hmm. That is, you don't have to do that. You can go directly to her website. On her website, she has the yarn available that's in the book. And so you can go to her yarn, right to, okay. to her website and order it. And you can get 20% off if you have a secret code. Oh. Should we reveal the secret code? Well, I think, okay, yeah. Okay, so the secret code is Cabin Boy Fan. Cabin Boy Fan, it's good for the month of July. And oh. you will have 20% off on the book you can wow. order the book and you can also buy the patterns on there if you want to um you can buy the yarn it's and it's a great it's a really really interesting website as well and how did this come about because this is the first i hear of it so that's wonderful <laughs> because and they can, it's uh, fantastic like you want to get the book for the stories alone yes the blends of yarn wonderful wonderful patterns but i love that there's an entire story she does the illustrations and these very very one-of-a-kind very unique blends of wonderful wonderful fleece yeah and i think i did mention i did pick up somewhere that i think because i'm sure there's a limited a limited amount of these blends because they'd have to be spun together specifically for her patterns which makes every pattern absolute unique yeah i'm so proud of her i just think this is incredible that's and incredible it's and i think yeah. we're fortunate enough to endeavor to happen upon her and find out this whole story. And I mean, her story is just as interesting as the story Absolutely. maker's story. 
and it's not often you happen upon somebody like that. So highly recommend checking out her website um, and the book as well. The book's great. So love, love, loved it. Agreed. <laughs> so what's next on the agenda? The next item is we are going to announce the winner of the last episode. So in the last episode, we asked people to name where Knit City is going to be next year. The answer is Toronto. Everybody got it right. Everybody got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to pick a name. That's difficult. We're going to pick a name. And they win um, yarn from the exclusive yarn for uh, that we developed for the show. For Knit City, okay, we saved a bunch of it. It was inspired by the show. So we announced the winner. They get Knit City yarn. And then yeah. we're talking about another contest. Yes. Yeah, but that's the next. You would jump, or jump to the next oh agenda gosh. item. Okay, so this one, I, what I thought I would do is a lot of people, and I mentioned this in the last episode, one of the big mistakes we made at Knit City was I didn't have samples for all oh. of the yarn that was knit. Okay. Well, I, okay, it was pointed out to me I by a number of women. Well, I know, but the thing is... I don't know. I don't understand creative minds. It's, well, they just want to see what it looks like. And well, so, I know. They need to... They do. I get that part. But I'm not of the same mindset. So this is how this knits up. And... We'll um, have to... Well, you'll need a close-up. Yeah, you will. A close-up sure. of that. But it, it's it, it's fantastic to knit with. It's well, gorgeous. We, it's, have, we had four sock samples there. And this is what we brought because... I mean, if we were to have a sample from every, do we, do, can we make, you know, a, a hundred samples? I don't think so. We need test so, that's what. No, but the thing is this. We, I don't think we need a swatch for every single skein of yarn. Because if it's, if it's dyed the same way, only in different colors, it's going to end up the same way. Or very, very, very close to what you see there. And we had four samples of socks to show, to give you an example of how these multiples, multiple colors dual colors knit up some of them if you dyed it 50 50 they're almost like a self striping because it repeats the pattern but i get that when you're trying to explain what it's going to look like yeah you can't have well especially when it's the eye. it was the yarn for the the festival we yeah should, we should knit something up yeah so I, I i still yeah anyway uh, anyway so let's get back to the happy place where so when you look at this <laughs> so when you look at this and you look at this my only thing is, you look at this, it's a blend. You look at this, it's going to blend up. And that because it's a small... It looks fantastic. It's amazing. And because because the pa what happens with all of our dyed yarn, if you were to string this out and pull it out, there are sections colored. So the sections are always going to repeat themselves. So yeah. It's just at what lengths. We don't, we don't do measuring, so we're not going to be able to measure and say, oh, you're going to have six inches... Yeah. Of blue, six white, six inches of white, six inches of blue, repetitively. Right. It's going to repeat itself, but it's in what manner does it repeat sure. itself? So even if you do a swatch this big, you're going to have these stripes. And you could see clearly almost, a, um, what do you call that? Like a grouping of stripes. There's a group of stripes, blue, group stripes, blue, group stripes. If you knit this on a sweater, it's going to look totally different. You're still yep. going to have the stripes, but they're going to be fewer and far between. Right. Yep. So how do you explain that? This is one one project. If you knit it in the round or in a, not in the round, but in a hat, let's say in a swirl, it's going to look different than You're the right. swatch as well. Right. So you have to have an open mind to be able to imagine how it's going to knit up based on what we do show. Yes. Now, Jamie... People are sitting out there thinking, oh my gosh, would you just get to the announce who the winner is for the yarn? <laughs> so, <laughs> Don't you understand? I did that on purpose because I was building up the It's the anticipation. I can like, see. Oh my God, they're sitting on the edge of the seat waiting for the name to be called. I can see the and steam coming from the, the camera. Exactly. <laughs> the It's all the anticipation. So the drum roll, please. So I, how did I select this? I went through and blindly picked one. It's almost like if you could scroll through, if you could go sc a scroll and roll, and it scroll goes and like a yes, yeah. then the name that pops up because there were many, many, many names to choose from. And the winner is Dorothy Pender. Dorothy Dorothy Pender eight four one four. That is the name that was on the the correct response. So thank you very much, Dorothy, for entering. Thank you everyone for entering. Uh, really excited about that and happy to send you some yarn. 
So they contact you, correct? No, this contact is the thing. me. We've had contests, and then most people contact us. We've had one, yes, and I have to follow up on that one. But we sometimes we have to follow up a few times. It's not yes. just one time. Yep. To follow up and say, yep, like they've contacted or they've and they've not, and the prize sits for some time because it's like, I don't know if I was winning a wonderful prize, I'd be like, send me my prize. Maybe we should do it like Drag Race, where if they don't win, then the prize gets moved over to the second, the next person, <laughs> and it keeps accumulating. It keeps accumulating. We just like <laughs> we did get a response back, so then you just, but it's almost like then do you call out another name, or you're right, we move it to the next episode, and the next episode you get that and the next, and the booty just builds and builds the and booty. builds. Yes. Oh, not the booty. What am I saying? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. The co the coffee's just the no, coffee's just the kicked in. Well, there's no t the bounty. The bounty. The bounty. <laughs> oh, where's my? Oh my, my gosh, mind? you're back on Toxic Farms. Stop it! I knew you're you were going to say that. I knew you're you back were thinking about Jacob. That. Now I'm blushing. <laughs> no, I meant the bounty that came out. You know, the bounty. It could be the booty, but in this okay. case, it's yarn. Okay. <laughs> oh my god, that's so wrong. Okay. The coffee's so, not helping. The, we are also going to have another contest. The contest is because okay. we hit 100, the magic 100, Yay. in the last episode. And so... Is that... I thought... I feel like we've done 200 episodes. No. And so the question is... Are you going to... I may, Do I even know the answer? No, you don't know the answer. Oh, well, yeah, you, I hope you know the answer. We covered a book today, and it's the name of the book. Okay. Yeah. And that so, makes sense. Yes, and we will be drawing names for that in the next episode as well so i just want to thank everybody for watching today uh, we always have fun pulling this together and reaching out to you and i love that i love especially when i learn something about a new sheep yes. even though it's a, it's a poly polyamorous poly this poly that poly mix payout sheep it's still a sheep and it's a very popular sheep yeah and i enjoy you sharing your knowledge because i learn as well and I'm sure everyone up there does as well. And we also enjoy the comments, the comments that come in. So thank you so much for sharing those as well. So everybody, I hope you have a great summer. I hope it's kicking off beautifully, uh, like it is here at the cabin. And we wish everyone a great week. Well, I hope we're going to see them again before the end of the summer. Of the course we are. just started. Yes, We'll absolutely. see you again real soon. <laughs> Abito, mes amis. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.